Attention signals, grades K through five. One of the most important management tools you can have as a teacher is an attention signal. You'll use this signal anytime you want to get your students' attention, whether you're in the classroom, on a field trip, in the hallway, or anywhere else with your students. Just like an orchestra conductor uses a signal to get musicians to stop their individual warm-up and pay attention so that everyone can begin playing together, you will use the attention signal to get students to interrupt their individual efforts and focus on you so that you can give directions or provide instruction. Okay, can I have your attention please? Attention signals can vary, but there is one that's generally regarded as highly effective because it is visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and portable. Let's watch. Boys and girls, may I please have your attention? One, two, three, four, five. Excellent job. Notice she's speaking in a firm voice, but not shouting. And swinging her arm from a nine o'clock position to 12 o'clock gives a strong visual cue and prompts the students to raise their hands also. With a technique like this, even the students who weren't initially paying attention will see their classmates raise their hands and join in. Another reason this signal is effective is that it can be used anywhere inside the classroom and out, and combines both visual and audio elements. Other signals are not as effective because they lack one or all of these features. For example, flicking the lights only works indoors and is not a signal that you can carry elsewhere like onto the playground. Hey, hey, hey. Watch as this teacher, who usually flicks the lights to get her students' attention, is trying to get her students' attention outside. Although clapping your hands provides both visual and auditory cues, it requires repetition, and it may be a while before you have all of the students' attention. If you've found a signal other than the one we've described in detail here that works for you, by all means stick with it. If not, we urge you to try this proven method of attention getting. Whatever signal you decide to use, teach it to the students on the very first day of class. Boys and girls, we are going to go ahead and do our attention signal. Remember that we need to have our eyes on me focused within five seconds. Ready? It may take a few attempts before the students get it right. Boys and girls, may I please have your attention? One, two, three, four, Five. Ooh, not so good. I see Josias and Margarito not having Notice their how she is providing feedback to the students who are doing it incorrectly. She needs your attention, she needs a hundred percent. That means I need to see every student with their hand up and looking at me. Okay? Your eyes need to be focused in on me. Otherwise you're not gonna hear what I have to say. All right. Let's try it again. Boys and girls, may I please have your attention? One two, three, four, five. Excellent job, hands down. Very good job on following our attention signal. It's strongly recommended that you keep the response time to five seconds. As with teaching any strategy, it's always important to teach your expectations for the desired behavior, monitor the behavior, and provide feedback. Always give them positive feedback when they respond properly. Excellent job, Margarito, for looking at me within five seconds with your hand up. Very good job. Yes. Before you move on to the lesson, make sure you indeed have everyone's attention. Don't move on unless you do. And remember, your goal is 100% participation within five seconds. Without an effective attention signal, you may find yourself repeatedly asking students to stop what they're doing and yelling over them. It's possible you might never get them to give you their attention, and you give up feeling frustrated. In contrast, having an effective attention signal like this one will help you feel confident, in control of your classroom, and create a learning environment. Attention signals, grades 6 through 12. One of the most important management tools you can have as a teacher is an attention signal. You'll use this signal anytime you want to get your students' attention, whether you're in the classroom, on a field trip, in the hallway, or anywhere else with your students. 
Just like an orchestra conductor uses a signal to get musicians to stop their individual warm-up and pay attention so that everyone can begin playing together, you will use the attention signal to get students to interrupt their individual efforts and focus on you so that you can give directions or provide instruction. Okay, can I have your attention please? Attention signals can vary, but there is one that's generally regarded as highly effective because it is visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and portable. Let's watch. All right, guys, can I have your attention, please? Awesome. Thank you very much. You can put your hands down. All right, today we're going to be discussing myths. Notice she's speaking in a firm voice, them. but not shouting. And swinging her arm from a 9 o'clock position to 12 o'clock gives a strong visual cue and prompts the students to raise their hands also. With a technique like this, even the students who weren't initially paying attention will see their classmates raise their hands and join in. All right, can I have your attention please? Another reason this signal is effective is that it can be used anywhere inside the classroom and out and combines both visual and audio elements. Other signals are not as effective because they lack one or all of these features. For example, Flicking the lights only works indoors and is not a signal that you can carry elsewhere. Watch as this teacher, who usually flicks the lights to get her students' attention, is trying to get her students' attention outside. Although clapping your hands provides both visual and auditory cues, it requires repetition and it may be a while before you have all of the students' attention. If you've found a signal other than the one we've described in detail here that works for you, by all means stick with it. If not, we urge you to try this proven method of attention getting. Whatever signal you decide to use, teach it to the students on the very first day of class. Here's how. In the future, when I need to get your attention, I'm going to use an attention signal just like this. I'm going to say, class, may I have your attention, please? And I'm going to put my hand up and show you all five of my fingers. What I want you to do is to put your hand up and show me all five of your fingers. So let's try that together. Class, can I have your attention, please? Awesome. When your hand is in the air, you are going to have your mouth closed, your eyes are going to be on me, and you're going to be giving me your full attention. So let's try that one more time. Class, can I have your attention, please? Very good. I expect you to be able to do this within five seconds, but if you can do it faster than that, that's even better. So let's do it one last time. It may right, take class, a few attempts before please? the students get it right. Class, may I have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? Thank you very much. All right, remember, the response time should be within five seconds. So when I put my hand in the air and say, may I have your attention, I expect you to mimic me and have your mouth closed so that I have your full attention. Thank you very much. Your expectation should include a time limit for students to respond to your signal. It's strongly recommended that you keep the response time to five seconds. As with teaching any strategy, it's always important to teach your expectations for the desired behavior, monitor the behavior, and provide feedback. Remember, we are in the hallway, so our conversation level is at a one. Let's go. Always give them positive feedback when they respond properly. Very good. Thank you so much. Before you move on to the lesson, make sure you indeed have everyone's attention. Don't move on unless you do. And remember, your goal is 100% participation within five seconds. Without an effective attention signal, you may find yourself repeatedly asking students to stop what they're doing and yelling over them. It's possible you might never get them to give you their attention and you give up feeling frustrated. In contrast, having an effective attention signal like this one will help you feel confident, in control of your classroom, and create a learning environment. Expectations, grades K through five. Think about the expectations you have set for your class and for all of the transitions in your day and lessons in your curriculum. Are they clear in your mind? More importantly, have you made them clear to your students? Setting your expectations is important because you are more likely to get the behavior you want for each activity. Imagine if you had to guess at what your job is and what is the expected result. It would not be easy to do your job well. It's the same for students who don't know what is expected of them for each of the day's activities. There is a three-step process for teaching expectations. 
The steps are teach, monitor, and provide feedback. Teach. Let's say you're about to have your class move to a small group center activity. Before beginning, let them know what your expectations are using CHAMPS. We are getting ready to go into our center activities, but before we do that, we need to have everybody's eyes up here so we can champ out this activity. Our conversation is going to be a one to a two. I need limited talking, and you're only supposed to be talking with the people in your group. It has to be about the assigned activity. I do not want to hear talking about what you did over the weekend. Okay. If you need help, I need you to ask three before me. If there are no more than three people in your group, then please ask as many as you can. If it can't be three, then you come to me. Um, they need to be in your center. Please try not to bother anybody else in another center. Notice how clear this teacher is with her expectations. She tells the students exactly what she wants for this activity. Um, remember, you only have 20 minutes to complete the task, so when that bell rings, be ready to switch to the next center rotation or small group. Um, our movement is limited. Okay, if I'm actually with the small group, reading with them, then you need to just use your movement to go to the bathroom, to get a drink. You do not need to give me the signal. Our participation, you are going to be on task with the task that I've assigned for you in your center or small group. You need to complete the activity as best you can, and remember, I won't be collecting it until Friday. Does anybody have any questions? And you need to tell me when you're writing. In this example, the teacher has the students repeat her expectations. When you need help, what will you do? And our activity, is it going to be whole group? We're doing it all together. Are you going to be walking around? Is there movement? No. How do I know you're participating? Listening, thinking, and responding. And when I need your attention. The students now know exactly what the teacher expects of them. Monitor. Once you've made your expectations clear, you can start the activity. But these students aren't adhering to the assigned conversation level. Correct them before continuing. All right, boys, remember we're supposed to be on task. We only have a limited time to get this done, so you'll probably get more done if you stay on the task. Okay, thank you so much. Once the activity has begun, walk around the room and monitor them to make sure they stay on track. For example, this student is getting out of her seat for help. The assigned rule for help is that the students are to ask three and then me. Remind them of this. Oh, ask three in your group. Remember we talked about that? Go ahead and try that and then if you need help, come and get me. Yes. Monitoring is a very important step in this process, so continue to monitor the students by circulating the room and scanning for misbehaviors. Correct them as they occur. Provide feedback. During the activity, it's very important to provide feedback to the students about how they're implementing the expectations. This helps them know what they are doing correctly or incorrectly. Both positive and corrective feedback are important. Give positive to corrective feedback in a ratio of 3 to 1. Always praise them when they get back on track. Patrick, were you able to get the answer you were looking for? Yes. Wonderful. At the end of the activity, provide feedback on how well they implemented the expectations overall. If improvement is needed for next time, say so and reiterate what your expectations are. I saw a lot of kids talking about what they needed to be doing, asking where they're going to find the definitions using the glossary. You utilized your CHAMP for that activity and it worked out fabulous. We were able to get a lot done in a short amount of time. Okay, so I'm very pleased with how you did and I expect the same thing for you tomorrow. We'll CHAMP out our activity for tomorrow and hopefully we'll run as smoothly as we did today. Excellent. Every teacher will have different expectations for an activity, and different activities require different expectations. What's important is that prior to any activity, you decide what your expectations are so you can let your students know. Expectations, grades 6 through 12. Think about the expectations you have set for your class and for all of the transitions in your day and lessons in your curriculum. Are they clear in your mind? 
More importantly, have you made them clear to your students? Setting your expectations is important because you are more likely to get the behavior you want for each activity. Imagine if you had to guess at what your job is and what is the expected result. It would not be easy to do your job well. It's the same for students who don't know what is expected of them for each of the day's activities. There is a three-step process for teaching expectations. The steps are teach, monitor, and provide feedback. Teach. Let's say you're about to have your class work on a small group activity. Before beginning, let them know what your expectations are using CHAMPS. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and give you my expectations for the activity you're going to be doing today. We're going to champ the activity. The activity is called Elements of Plot Movie Merry-Go-Round. Okay. Conversation level. Yes, you will be able to talk today. Your level will be two, all right? The conversation should be about the elements of plot for your movie, and you should be discussing this with your group members. For help, you can go ahead and you can ask your group members first, okay? Rely on each other. If you cannot answer the question, you go ahead and you can raise your hand and I'll come over and I'll assist you. For the activity, you guys are gonna use the labels that are on each station. You're gonna use those labels to identify the elements of plot from a movie that you have chosen. Afterwards, you guys are gonna go ahead and you are going to create a... Notice how clear this teacher is with her expectations. She tells the students exactly what she wants for this activity. We're going to be moving counterclockwise to a different station. I want you all moving in an orderly fashion, okay? No running, there's no rush. Just get up, move to the next station, and complete the assignment. When you hear the buzzer, Get up, move to the next station, complete the assignment, okay? Participation, at the sound of the buzzer, you'll go ahead and you'll move, all right? You will be discussing only the elements of plot. And for the signal, I will say eyes up here, my hand will go up, and what are your guys' hands going to do? Mm. Muchas gracias, all right? Questions? The students now know exactly what the teacher expects of them. Monitor. Once you've made your expectations clear, you can start the activity. But these students aren't adhering to the assigned conversation level. Correct them before continuing. Okay, you need to turn around and help your group out. Once the activity has begun, walk around the room and monitor them to make sure they stay on track. For example, this student is getting out of her seat for help. The assigned rule for help is that the students are to raise their hands and that you will come to them. Remind them of this. And then you raise your hand, right? Okay, so go back to your seat and raise your hand. Monitoring is a very important step in this process, so continue to monitor the students by circulating the room and scanning for misbehaviors. Correct them as they occur. Provide feedback. During the activity, it's very important to provide feedback to the students about how they're implementing the expectations. This helps them know what they are doing correctly or incorrectly. Both positive and corrective feedback are important. Give positive to corrective feedback in a ratio of three to one. Always praise them when they get back on track. And I think you were working so nicely with your group. At the end of the activity, provide feedback on how well they implemented the expectations overall. If improvement is needed for next time, say so, and reiterate what your expectations are. What conversation? You guys are supposed to be working within your group. Sometimes I had to redirect. You were talking to each other. You were not at a level two. All right? In order for us to have these fun activities, it's important for you guys to follow my expectations. So for next time, and there will be a next time because I love these activities, we need to make sure that we're following the champs very carefully. Every teacher will have different expectations for an activity, and different activities require different expectations. What's important is that prior to any activity, you decide what your expectations are so you can let your students know.
Transitions, grades K through five. Transitions are those times when students move from one task to another or from one activity to another. For example, the class is transitioning from a teacher-directed reading lesson to working independently, or math is over and it's time to go to lunch. Transitions can be problematic because students often see them as a time to misbehave. But it doesn't have to be that way if you make your expectations for each transition clear with the help of CHAMPS. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Thank you very much. I have 100% participation within five seconds. Hands down, eyes on me. We are getting out a book. We are changing over to reading. So I would like no voice level. We are on a zero. If you need help, I need you to raise your hand. I am going to tell you and write, the write on the board the book and the page number. Within 10 seconds, I expect all students to have the book on the proper page and be waiting quietly. Remember, we are on a zero. There will be no movement. The only thing you need to do is reach under and grab your reading book. As soon as instruction is given, you will open your book quickly and quietly and wait for further directions. The last step is the attention signal will be used when we need it. At this point in time, will you please open your reading book to page 90. Let's watch again. This time the students will be lining up. We are transitioning now. Here are my expectations for you. Your conversation level lining up and in the hallways is always on a zero. That means you are silent. If you need help at any point in time, I'd like you to raise your hands. Our activity is that you will be standing up and walking quickly and quietly to our line. I would like you to line up with one tile space between you and the person in front of you. I can tell that you're participating because you will stand, walk quickly and quietly to the single file line. When we enter the hallway, I want you walking on the line facing forward. Notice how specific the teacher is being with his expectations. This helps ensure that he gets the desired behavior. Okay, we are going to prepare to line up now. Row three, will you please stand and walk quietly to the door. Students in their seats, I like the way that they're walking quietly. They're lining up with one tile space between them. Row two, will you please stand and do exactly as row three just did? Notice he releases the rows one at a time, reinforces his expectations, and gives positive feedback. I like the way that your hands are at your sides. I like the way that my students are facing forward. Row one, will you please complete this beautiful line? Let's watch as the teacher continues to reinforce his expectations as they travel together through the hallways. I like the way each student has their hand on the railing for safety and is going down the stairs one stair at a time. This time, they will be moving from center to center. Your conversation level when we are at centers and moving from center to center is at a zero. That means I should not hear a sound. If you need help while you're moving from center to center, I expect you to raise your hand. Thank you for that excellent example in the back. I know you're paying attention. Your activity is that you will listen for bell sounds to tell you what to do. If you hear one bell sound, I would like your undivided attention on me. When you hear two bell sounds, you will clean up your activity and move to the next center. When you hear three bell sounds, I would like you to clean up your activity and return to your seats. You will be moving during this activity when you hear the correct bell dings. I will know that you are participating when I see you moving quickly and quietly to each center. In this instance, the attention signal is the bell. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now we are preparing to go to centers. Row one, will you please stand and go to the Technology Center? Notice that they're doing so quickly and quietly. Row two, please stand. Science Center. Compliments to each group for moving quickly and quietly. I can tell that you are participating because you're getting right down to work. You'll notice that his expectations for different transitions vary depending on the activity and that he has clearly communicated these expectations to the class. The higher structure your class, the more tightly you'll format your transitions. Either way, it is not as important how the expectations are conveyed, but that they are conveyed. Communicating your expectations for transitions clearly will help you manage them most effectively and leave more time for learning.
Transitions, grades 6 through 12. Transitions are those times when students move from one task to another or from one activity to another. For example, the class is transitioning from a teacher-directed reading lesson to working independently, or they're clearing their desks in preparation for a test. Transitions can be problematic because students often see them as a time to misbehave. But it doesn't have to be that way if you make your expectations for each transition clear with the help of CHAMPS. One, two, three, hands up, mouths closed. Thank you for your attention. You are going to be turning in your classwork when you are done. Remember the procedures for turning in your classwork. Conversation while you're turning in your papers should be at a zero. Raise your hand if you need my help at any time. You are allowed to move from your desk to the drawer then you can go to the bookshelf and select a book. No more than two students at the bookshelf at a time, and you're only allowed to be at the bookshelf for one minute. Remember the signal if I need to get your attention is one, two, three, hands up, mouths closed. Do you have any questions? Okay, you can go ahead and turn in your papers now if you need to. Redirect them as necessary. Chris, remember, only two students at the bookshelf at a time. Thank you. Now watch as she handles this transition. Put your textbook under your desk. We are at a level zero conversation right now. Please go ahead and pass your papers forward. You are only turning into me the paper with the questions. You keep the questions you answered as your study guide for homework over the weekends. When you get the papers, please pass them down to the left until they reach Antonio. And here they will be getting ready for dismissal. When I call your group up, you're going to go get your book bag from the back of the room, bring it back to your desk and pack up. Your conversation should be at a level zero. If you need my help at any time during dismissal, please raise your hand. You are going to be clearing your desk for dismissal, walking to the back as I call your group, getting your book bag, bringing it back to your desk and packing up. After you pack up, please sit quietly and wait for me to dismiss you. You are allowed to move from your desk to the back of the room and back to your desk. I'll know you're participating because you will be walking quietly, packing up quietly, and sitting facing forward ready for dismissal. Do you have any questions? Okay, we're ready for dismissal. Please remember your conversation level should be at a zero. Green, please go get your book bags and pack up. Orange, please go get your book bags and pack up. Here's another example that requires that the class move as a group from the classroom to another location. Right now we're going to go to the computer lab. Let me just remind you our procedures for walking in the hall. While we're walking in the hall, our conversation is at a level zero. If at any time while we're walking you need to get my attention or have a question, please raise your hand. Please keep your hands to yourself at all times. Keep your hands off of anybody else and please your hands off of the walls, off of the bulletin boards. I'll know you're participating. I'll know you're walking nicely. When I see a nice straight line, I don't see any heads out of the way. I don't see any hands coming out, and I don't hear any talking. Do you guys have any questions? No. Gabrielle, please open the door. Cole, please walk all the way to the fire extinguisher and stop. You'll notice that the teacher's expectations for different transitions school, vary school depending on the right. activity and that expectations are clearly communicated to the class. Thank you, Micaiah, for keeping your hands to yourself. The higher structure your class, the more tightly you'll format your transitions. Either way, it is not as important how the expectations are conveyed, but that they are conveyed. Communicating your expectations for transitions clearly will help you manage them most effectively and leave more time for learning. Non-contingent attention, grades K through 5. Non-contingent attention is not based on a student's accomplishments or actions. It is the giving of your time and attention because you value and notice them as people. Experts agree that you should use every possible opportunity to show your students this valuable form of attention. Why is this important? 
Good morning. Saw you at the game last night. Come on in. Put your homework on your desk. When students feel valued and noticed, they're more likely to engage in appropriate behavior. This leads to a more positive classroom and school culture, increased self-esteem for the students, a more rewarding teaching experience for you, supportive peer interactions, and a stronger academic environment. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning Reese. How are you? Good. As an adult, you've probably noticed that a simple hello can make you feel special. Well, students like it too. A leading expert on student discipline and motivation explains that saying hello to your students is like making a deposit in the bank. Over time, your deposits add up, and the students become more likely to want to abide by your rules for cooperation and success. This is especially important because many students come to us with emotional bank accounts that are almost empty. Elementary teachers will want to greet their students all day long, like when they come back from specials or return from recess. Be sure to spread your attention around and greet different students throughout each day and as the week goes on. Your goal is to make every student feel valued in his or her own way. You can even add something simple about yourself to further personalize the interaction. Make sure you don't confuse non-contingent attention with becoming overly personal. You're not trying to be a friend or a peer. You are trying to be an authority figure who cares about his or her students as people. But saying hello is not the only way to make a deposit. Yeah? Do you play football? No? If you were to play football, what position would you play? You can also engage students in a conversation about a shared sports experience. Smile at the students. Chat with a student about brothers, sisters, hobbies, or pets. Incorporate students' names in word problems. And share stories from your experiences relative to the topic being discussed. Speaking with them about their interests this way shows you care. You can also do this quietly with one or two students as you escort them from lunch. Here's another idea. Circulate the classroom and teach from various areas. Ask students how they feel they are doing in class and offer extra help if they feel they need it at any time. Your writing looks very interesting. Can't wait till I get a chance to read it. This is another excellent way to show non-contingent attention. And our activity, is it going to be whole group? We're doing it all together. Are you going to be walking around? Is there movement? Finally, remember that no matter the level of structure your classroom needs, high, medium, or low, every student whose life you touch deserves your attention in an inviting, friendly, and non-contingent way. This shows them and everyone in your school that you care about your students and that you have a genuine interest in helping them succeed. Non-contingent attention, grades 6 through 12. Non-contingent attention is not based on a student's accomplishments or actions. It is the giving of your time and attention because you value and notice them as people. Experts agree that you should use every possible opportunity to show your students this valuable form of attention. Why is this important? Non-contingent attention models tone for students to emulate, creates a positive relationship with the teacher, helps to create a positive classroom climate, and helps to increase the likelihood that students will be cooperative. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Sarah, how's everything going all right? Good, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, morning. morning Miss Alyssa. Are we feeling better today? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Notice how the teacher is giving attention to the students who are absent. This shows that he cares about them as people. You can get to the cafeteria, okay? All right. Thank you. As an adult, you've probably noticed that a simple hello can make you feel special. Well, students like it, too. A leading expert on student discipline and motivation explains that saying hello to your students is like making a deposit in the bank. Over time, your deposits add up, and the students become more likely to want to abide by your rules for cooperation and success. This is especially important because many students come to us with emotional bank accounts that are almost empty. You don't need to say an individual hello to every student as they pass by, but do smile and be pleasant and be sure to spread your attention around as the week goes on. Your goal is to make every student feel valued in his or her own way. You can even add something simple about yourself to further personalize the interaction. 
How was lunch, guys? Chicken fingers. Chicken fingers. I love chicken fingers. Make sure you don't confuse non-contingent attention with becoming overly personal. You're not trying to be a friend or a peer. You are trying to be an authority figure who cares about his or her students as people. But saying hello is not the only way to make a deposit. You ready to start up Ambassador Club at school? Yeah. You're excited to make some posters for it? You can also engage students in a conversation about a shared sports experience. Stay at home. Chat with a student about brothers, sisters, hobbies, or pets. Circulate the classroom and teach from various areas. Smile at the students. Ask a student to help collect papers. Ask them to help you answer the phone, write on the board, or borrow something from the class next door. And share stories from your experiences relative to the topic being discussed. You can also do this quietly with one or two students as you escort them to the media center. I haven't seen that one. How was it? Well, it's pretty good. I mean, Here's another uh... idea. Ask students how they feel they are doing in class and offer extra help if they feel they need it at any time. This is another excellent way to show non-contingent attention. How are you? Just want to let you know, I know when I talked about Social Studies Fair the other day, you had a few questions. If you need anything, just let me know. We can always get a note from your mom giving you permission to stay after school, and then we can stay after. I can give you any extra help you need, work on the computer, printing out things if you need it, okay? All right, so don't be too nervous about it. We'll take care Finally, of it. Finally, remember that no matter the level of structure your classroom needs, high, medium, or low, every student whose life you touch deserves your attention in an inviting, friendly, and non-contingent way. This shows them and everyone in your school that you care about your students and that you have a genuine interest in helping them succeed. Corrective procedures grades K through 5. Sometimes, no matter how organized your classroom is or how well you've established expectations, your students may misbehave. Fortunately, you have a variety of tools to help minimize incidents of misbehavior. Let's take a look. Pre-correction. Pre-correction means anticipating problem behavior and intervening before the student has had a chance to act up. Boys and girls, we're getting ready to work with our partners. I expect that you be focused on the activity, that you use your number two voice, your level. The voice. problem behavior is therefore prevented, and eventually the expected behavior should replace the problematic one. Your focus on the material. Are we ready? Let's take a look at what not to do. Stop talking so loud! Remember the right I way. Expect that you be focused on the activity. Proximity control. Proximity control is when a teacher stands physically close to a misbehaving student to non-verbally communicate that he or she is aware of the misbehavior. This is very effective because it allows you to communicate what is expected without interrupting the lesson. Here's an example of what doesn't work. Would you stop digging in that backpack when I'm trying to teach? Remember, keep moving. Semi-private correction. When you see a misbehavior occurring, a semi-private correction may be a good strategy. To do this, walk over to the misbehaving student and whisper a quiet reminder, something like, Jared, you need to stay on task. This avoids embarrassing him, which may make the misbehavior increase over time. This is a don't. Jared, wake up! You do not sleep in my room! Remember, the more private the correction, the less likely the student will be to challenge you. Hit and run. The hit and run strategy is effective because it gets right to the point. You approach the misbehaving student, remind him or her to get back on track by putting your hand on their desk, and then you walk away. This eliminates any opportunity for the student to argue with you or for you to uselessly dwell on the misbehavior. Remember to move away as soon as you correct the behavior. Gentle verbal reprimand. Gentle verbal reprimands can be effective for minor misbehaviors. Give a matter-of-fact statement telling the student or students what they should be doing. 
Excuse me, I need the two of you please remember that we're supposed to be reading passage 8. Gentle verbal reprimands are to be brief, immediate, calm, and consistent. This is what not to do. Put that stuff away! Every day I have to tell y'all to stop playing with this stuff! Remember, verbal reprimands work best if you state the desired behavior rather than reiterate the misbehavior. Discussion Sometimes speaking with a student about a misbehavior can help him or her understand your expectations. Don't try to speak with the student about it then and there. You'll be angry and he or she will react offensively. Plus, you'll waste valuable class time and call too much attention to the misbehaving student, which may be what they are seeking. Daniel, you realize I took this ball from you because you were playing with it at an inappropriate time? Remember to wait until a neutral time for best results. And leave it at home and play with it after school. Notice how these corrective procedures cause very little, if any, interruption to the class, therefore creating seamless instruction. Redirection. This corrective strategy involves redirecting the student back to the rules of the classroom or back to the task at hand. Who can raise your hand and give me another one? Please die. Terry? Remember, you want to raise your hand when we're doing this, okay? Thank you. Don't embarrass the student in front of the class. You're supposed to raise your hand. We go through this every day. Notice how embarrassing the student causes the behavior to escalate. Give positive feedback after a correction whenever possible. Praise responsible behavior. When one student is misbehaving, it can be effective to praise those who are staying on task. Boys and girls, thank you for remembering to stay in your seat doing this activity. Remember, praising responsible behavior encourages it to occur more often amongst all of your students. Restitution. When a misbehavior causes damage, restitution is about making it right. Students may make mistakes, but they are able to take responsibility for their actions and choose positive solutions. I noticed that you were scribbling on the desk. We talked about respecting other people's property. Do you think you should have been writing on the desk? Yeah. Okay. Everybody make mistakes, but what are we going to do to correct it? Okay. You're going to clean it. That's a good choice. Go clean the desk. And it's okay. Thank okay. you. Don't make it sound like a punishment. Why are you scribbling on that desk? What are you thinking? Now you have a yellow card. Remember to use restitution as a teachable moment where students can take responsibility. Positive feedback. Giving positive feedback when behavior improves will encourage the student to increase the positive behaviors. Don't let the improvements go unnoticed. You can give positive feedback at the end of the lesson or at the end of the day, whichever is most appropriate to the situation. Family contact. When considering corrective procedures, you may wish to contact the family to discuss your concerns. Start the conversation by saying something positive. Second, be objective when describing the misbehavior, not judgmental. Third, Suggest that the family help communicate the expectation that the student behave more responsibly in the future. Fourth, don't imply that the student should be punished or made to behave. And finally, create a sense of partnership whose goal is to help the students succeed. You've just seen a wide range of corrective procedures you can use, and you'll likely try them in a variety of settings. Remember to use them consistently and unemotionally and in a way that matches the severity and frequency of the misbehavior. And finally, if one strategy doesn't work, try another. You can succeed in getting misbehaviors under control. Corrective Procedures, Grades 6 through 12. Sometimes, no matter how organized your classroom is or how well you've established expectations, your students may misbehave. 
Fortunately, you have a variety of tools to help minimize incidents of misbehavior. Using appropriate corrective procedures, such as those you're about to see, help create a more positive classroom climate. Let's take a look. Pre-correction. Pre-correction means anticipating problem behavior and intervening before the student has had a chance to act up. We are going to chunk this passage. You are going to read it in sections, but you are going to read it with your neighbor. So you are going to whisper read with your neighbor. You are going to speak at a level one so that only your neighbor can hear you. So what I want you to do when I give you the signal, you are going to turn to your neighbor and you are going to quietly tell your neighbor, we are going to whisper read this passage. Please do that now. The problem behavior is therefore prevented, and eventually the expected behavior should replace the problematic one. Being clear with your expectations is also a great way to pre-correct. Let's take a look at what not to do. Robert, I know that you never pay attention in class, so let's see if you can try to get it right today, okay? Remember the right way. You are way. going to chunk this passage. You are going to read it in sections. Proximity control. Proximity control is when a teacher stands physically close to a misbehaving student to non-verbally communicate that he or she is aware of the misbehavior. This is very effective because it allows you to communicate what is expected without interrupting the lesson. Here's an example of what doesn't work. I said put that away now. Remember, keep moving. Semi-private correction. When you see a misbehavior occurring, a semi-private correction may be a good strategy. To do this, walk over to the misbehaving student and whisper a quiet reminder. Michael, yes. I need you to take your headphones off, put them in your book bag, and get started on your do now, okay? This avoids embarrassing him, which may make the misbehavior increase over time. This is a don't. Michael, take off those headphones and get back to work. Remember, the more private the correction, the less likely the student will be to challenge you. Hit and run. The hit and run strategy is effective because it gets right to the point. You approach the misbehaving student, remind him or her to get back on track with a gesture, and then you walk away. This eliminates any opportunity for the student to argue with you or for you to uselessly dwell on the misbehavior. Remember to move away as soon as you correct the behavior. Gentle verbal reprimand. Gentle verbal reprimands can be effective for minor misbehaviors. Give a matter-of-fact statement telling the student or students what they should be doing. Remember, ladies, backpacks on the floor. Remember, gentlemen, the P in champs. The way that I know that you're participating is if you are quietly copying your vocabulary. Gentle verbal reprimands are to be brief, immediate, calm, and consistent. This is what not to do. Why are you talking? And girls, why are your book bags on your chairs? Remember, verbal reprimands work best if you state the desired behavior rather than reiterate the misbehavior. Discussion. Sometimes speaking with a student about a misbehavior can help him or her understand your expectations. Don't try to speak with the student about it then and there. You'll be angry and he or she will react defensively. Jennifer, you need to stop doodling. Plus, you'll waste valuable class time and call too much attention to the misbehaving student, which may be what they are seeking. Remember to wait Hi. until a neutral time for Bye -bye. best results. Jennifer, can I speak to you for a moment? Now, I noticed you were doodling in class today. Now, I realize you like doodling and that you're very good at it, but in the future, I think it would be to your benefit if you pay attention in class, okay? I'll expect better tomorrow. All right, bye-bye. Notice how these corrective procedures cause very little, if any, interruption to the class, therefore creating seamless instruction. Use humor. Humor can be used to help diffuse a misbehavior. Okay, class, so why do you think dog fighting or chicken fighting as sports are considered illegal? Michelle? It's just wrong. Plain old wrong. Ooh, that's a great answer. Ooh, that's a great answer. Ah, do I have a substitute teacher in the class today? Talk to the student afterwards to make sure he or she understands that the behavior was inappropriate.
I hope I didn't embarrass you today by calling you out like that in class, but you do need to realize that it's not nice to make fun of people, okay? Let's show respect for each other in the future. Sorry. Sounds good. Don't confuse humor with sarcasm. Almost sounds like me, Jacob, but not quite. Keep working on it. Give positive feedback after a correction whenever possible. Restitution. When a misbehavior causes damage, restitution is about making it right. Students may make mistakes, but they are able to take responsibility for their actions and choose positive solutions. Hi. I've noticed that you left some pencil shavings on the floor. We want to keep the room looking nice for every student who comes in. Would you mind grabbing the broom and cleaning it up for me, please? Don't make it sound like a punishment. Look at the floor! You know what? Just for that, go get the broom and clean it up now. Remember to use restitution as a teachable moment where students can take responsibility. Positive feedback. Giving positive feedback when behavior improves will encourage the student to increase the positive behaviors. I love the way that you're staying on task, Sarah. Good job. Don't let the improvements go unnoticed. You can give positive feedback at the end of the lesson or at the end of the day, whichever is most appropriate to the situation. Family contact. When considering corrective procedures, you may wish to contact the family to discuss your concerns. Start the conversation by saying something positive. Second, be objective when describing the misbehavior, not judgmental. Third, suggest that the family help communicate the expectation that the student behave more responsibly in the future. Fourth, don't imply that the student should be punished or made to behave. And finally, create a sense of partnership whose goal is to help the students succeed. You've just seen a wide range of corrective procedures you can use, and you'll likely try them in a variety of settings. Remember to use them consistently and unemotionally, and in a way that matches the severity and frequency of the misbehavior. And finally, if one strategy doesn't work, try another. You can succeed in getting misbehaviors under control. CHAMPS is effective because it's a systematic way for coordinating a classroom. Um, the Randy Sprick model is very simple and when you coordinate using the CHAMPS model, uh, everything is spelled out for the kids. There's, there's no leeway for misbehavior and you know exactly where you're going with your lesson. We look at students as being a total package. The effective domain, the cognitive domain, the psycho domain. So what CHAMPS does, it gives them an opportunity as they're maybe misbehaving, teachers can proactively tune into some of those classroom management skills to be able to make sure they stay focused on the lesson and without escalating the problem. The management of behavior um, using the CHAMPS model makes things very simple. See, once you have the model in place, then students know what's expected of them. And those clear expectations is really what drives where you're going. So once the kids know what's expected, no one comes to do a bad job. They all would like to please their teacher. And the CHAMPS model helps them to do that. CHAMPS is very easy. And one of the reasons I believe it's very easy because it's common sense. Common sense to build, you know, to build on the positives and being able to make sure you reinforce the positives. So it's very easy, it's not that complicated at all. I, the teachers that use this just have the most engaging classrooms because their kids know exactly what they're going to do. So they can try those crazy lessons that, that no teacher was ever able to do because you were worried about the kids not, not doing what they're supposed to. When the kids are following the CHAMPS model, they know exactly what's expected of them. So they can try those lessons, they get very, very creative. Um, such ener energy and engaging classrooms that you see with the CHAMPS model. And those are the teachers who don't have as many problems. Those are the teachers who don't write many referrals. Those are teachers who don't have to send students to a timeout. So I would like for more teachers to realize how effective it is if it's used consistently. Be open-minded and give it a chance. And if you give it a chance and you start to see, to see the immediate results, then you'll be, you, know, you, you, you pretty much you know, get one over very quickly to say, you know, this stuff really works and you want to continue to do it and do it with fidelity. Students thrive on consistency and CHAMPS gives you a consistent classroom. All I can say is to all those who have not been a part of CHAMPS training, get the training and CHAMP it out.